and welcome back to our last session of Grade 11 Tourism Revision for Term 2. The topics that we'll be covering in this session is culture and heritage, job opportunities in the tourism industry, and entrepreneurship. So let's dive right in. Culture and heritage. So many tourists are coming to South Africa to visit significant sites. And so it's really important that we manage our heritage resources carefully so that they don't get destroyed or become worthless. The management of these heritage sites includes both cultural and natural heritage. So we're not just looking at buildings. We're also looking at natural sites um, of significant, like for example, in the Cape Town area, Table Mountain is a natural heritage. It's not, it's not a cultural heritage. So sometimes we don't associate that with heritage, but actually culture and nature, they also, they both form part of our heritage. So there are different heritage bodies that deal with the preservation and the protection and management of heritage in South Africa. And this happens at three levels, national, provincial, and local. So these are some of the things that you need to be able to do in this section, is to name and describe the South African heritage bodies, to identify the logo of SARA, and there it is on the right-hand side. And if you look very carefully at the logo, you'll actually see that it's got a picture of South Africa, the map of South Africa in the middle, and then it's got hands around the side um, to say that it's, this is all about protecting our South African heritage. You should be able to name the provincial heritage agencies of each province to describe special heritage permits and the protective regulations for uh, various things that we'll get into later. So let's start with some terminology. What is, uh, what is provincial heritage? Or let's start even just with what is heritage. Um, and so heritage is sites of con cultural significance and geographic areas of value. Those are heritage sites. And heritage is something that's sometimes difficult to explain because it has to do with what, what things get passed on to us. So as South Africans, we have a wide cultural heritage, a vast cultural heritage, and we also have such a beautiful country. And if, for those of you who maybe do geography or did geography somewhere way back in grade nine, you will remember that the different parts of South Africa have different types of vegetation. And that means that they have different types of beauty. The Karoo is very different from going to Mpumalanga and to seeing all those beautiful waterfalls and that subtropical area. But all of that is part of South Africa and all of that needs to be protected. <clears throat> so here we go, here are heritage sites. And as I said, sites of cultural significance and geographic areas of great value. <clears throat> From the baobab trees in Limpopo and Mpumalanga all the way down to Robben Island in the Western Cape. What is national heritage? Structures or defined areas of land declared by the South African Heritage Resources Agency, SARA, to be of historic or cultural importance. National heritage sites are known as grade one sites. All right, so I'm going to write this over here. So over here we have national heritage sites. And they are known as grade one sites. Okay. Then we have provincial heritage. And these are places or sites that are of heritage significance within the province that PARA has declared as a heritage site. And provincial heritage sites are grade two sites. So let's write that down. Provincial. Provincial heritage. Grade two.
And there we have some examples of the provincial heritage sites, uh, agencies, I beg your pardon. South African heritage agencies, these are agencies responsible for declaring, managing and protecting the heritage sites or resources within South Africa. So we have our first heritage resource agency and that's our national one. And remember that SARA is a public entity. So they're actually part of, a, they're a government department, um, but they've been given one job, just one job. And their job is to protect um, the heritage sites in South Africa. And um, so they, they are coming in at this level. If we look over here, SARA comes in here at national level. And they have oversight over all of the different heritage uh, bodies within South Africa. One other thing that we have to add over here, because this is where it all starts, is local heritage. And local heritage sites are site three. So the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to see that um, when heritage is discovered or identified, it normally gets identified at this level, first of all. It will start off as local heritage. And then in the preservation process and educating, possibly people will think, well, you know what? This isn't just important to a local community. This is actually important for us as our provincial identity. And so then it becomes the job of the provincial heritage agency to be able to preserve that and maintain it. Um, that site. But then if people in the province say, you know what, actually, this is such an amazing part of our heritage. This belongs to us as a nation, not just us as a province or the people, the predominant, the main people group within a province. Actually, this is part of our identity as a nation. So then, of course, then it gets, <clears throat> it becomes a national heritage site. And just in case you were wondering, hopefully you were asking the question for yourself, what happens if Sarah says, actually, the things that we have discovered, there's certain parts of our national heritage that is actually, it's significant for the world, then you may have figured this out already. But over here then, we would have world heritage sites. And in South Africa, we have 10 of those. Okay, but we're just interested now for this session with the provincial and the local heritage sites. Oh, there goes my pen. All right. So SARA, South African Heritage Resource Agency. And then PARA. So actually, um, the abbreviation it's easier if you just put the A in the middle there. Um, but the Provincial Heritage Resource Authority, they also identify places of sites or of heritage and declare them as heritage sites. But they can only do that, again, within their province. Okay, so they have authority within their province. And here are some examples, again, of those provincial heritage agencies. They also provide resources and training within their own provinces so that at a local level, people can start to identify what is part of our heritage, what is the, uh, our local heritage, and then that can go up to provincial heritage. All right, so what does SARA actually do? What is their job? Well, in 1999, um, the National Heritage Resources Act was gazetted and SARA was given this job to identify, to maintain, to resource, to educate South Africans about our, his, our heritage. Now, just a little bit of the history. Of course, prior to 1994, there were only certain cultures and certain views of history that were valued. Um, and they were very much attached to the people who were in power in South Africa before 1994, before our first democratic elections. So the history of 
the white Afrikaans, white English people in South Africa was valued and um, museums were built and artifacts, you know, things were found and put into museums to preserve and to remind people of that heritage. But that means that it left a whole bunch of South African heritage out up until that point. So it was really important for government to make a decision and to bring SARA into being and say, we need, actually, we need a department whose job it is to make sure that all South Africans know that their history and their heritage is important. Not just a few little groups over here, but everybody is important. And so part of what they have to do is they have to identify and manage those heritage sites. They've got to go and find them because if they weren't valued before, they've got to be found and said, actually, this is important. This is critical to our national heritage. It's critical to our history as South Africans. So they have to identify, find it, and then manage it well. So make sure that people aren't going there to some very beautiful tree that's part, that has been around for 800 or years or whatever, and they're writing and graffitiing their name on that tree. They need to make sure that there's proper management that protects the heritage so that people after us can also enjoy it. People after us can also say, wow, I didn't know that. Or they can go and visit. They can see those things for themselves. Okay, so they have to manage heritage resources of national significance for the present community and future generations. They also are responsible for declaring heritage sites and resources within South Africa. So that means that um, a national heritage site will get a plaque. That's like, that's a metal poster um, that will get put up at those different sites or venues. And if you've ever been to a cemetery or a graveyard, you will see that there will be a Sara plaque there that's got the Sara logo on it um, that says that this is a, um, a heritage site. Okay, they are also the national administrative body responsible for the protection. So they make the rule, they come up with rules and legislation and present those to government. And again, they're in charge of grade one sites. So what do they actually do? They identify, conserve and manage South Africa's cultural resources. They're in charge of the protection of South Africa's heritage. Um, Again, establishing national policies and standards. And then this is an important point. They promote education and training to encourage public involvement in identifying heritage resources. So just picture this with me. You have a small group of people who are involved in SARA um, and they have to help, they have to find heritage that re represents all the whole spectrum of South Africans. Now they're 55, or so million of us. So it's important that people get trained and people are educated as to how to find things that are important as part of your heritage. Also, different cultures have different things that are important to them, different pieces of furniture maybe, or different buildings or sites or outcrop of trees or rocks. Now, for me, it might not look impo important, but for somebody who's from that culture, that is a very important site. And so it's important that um, the general public, South Africans, know how to identify places of and things of cultural or heritage importance and then feed that back to Sara or go through their normal local and then provincial heritage uh, agencies. And then also they preserve heritage resources of cultural significance for the present or future generations, and they create public awareness and understanding of their heritage. Here is a list of the provincial heritage agencies that you need to know, and they all sort of end with RA, 
Resources Authority, most of them. So as you can see, there's one in the Eastern Cape, the Provincial Heritage Resources Authority, in the Free State, the Heritage Resources Authority, the Provincial Heritage Resources Authority for Gauteng, um, Amafa, Aquazulu Natal, um, for the KwaZulu Natal province, Limpopo Heritage Resources Authority, Mpumalanga Provincial Heritage Resources Authority, um, and Northwest as well, Northern Cape, and then Heritage Western Cape. So there are nine provincial uh, heritage resource agencies for our nine provinces. Okay, so what are they actually protecting? And this is what we have to know as well. So first of all, structures older than 60 years. So buildings, um, you cannot just tear a building down that's over 60 years old, or you can't just change it. If you want to, you have to apply for a permit to your provincial heritage resource um, authority. Um, because if that building that you can see on the slide, it's an example of a certain type of architecture, Cape Dutch architecture. Now, there aren't that many of those anymore. So if we tear that building down or you change it and decide, actually, I want to paint it pink and no more thatched roof. Well, that means that that doesn't exist anymore and people don't build in that manner anymore. So once it's gone, it's gone. And so the, her the provincial heritage agencies make sure that no that those um, structures and important places are not changed um, so that actually we can have an example of what it used to be like so that we can actually visit them and not just see pictures next um, archaeological and paleontological sites and materials huh, I got it right Individuals or communities that have claimed archaeological or paleontological sites must register these sites in the Heritage Register. And anybody who wants to change anything must have permission by means of a permit. On the left-hand side, you can see the Cradle of Humankind there. And hopefully you know that that's where the skulls um, of the Taung skull and um, Mrs. Place were found. Uh, and then... On the right hand side that's the outside of that actual the visitors area called Marupeng and so archaeological sites are places where there are evidence of culture so um, or people uh, and civilizations so those are if you find the hammer from somebody or you found a skull or whatever, those are, that's an archeological site. Paleontological has to do with plant matter. And um, so evidence and of um, plant matter, etc. cetera, um, that's also preserved as a fossil. Okay, all right. What else do they look at preserving? Meteorites. So what's the difference between a meteor and a meteorite? Well, a meteor is something that flies around in space, but it doesn't actually enter our, at, or even if it enters our atmosphere, it gets burned up before it hits the Earth's surface. A meteorite means that it's right here in front of me. You can touch it, you can feel it. And any rock that falls from outer space is actually the, the responsibility of SARA. And so people who already have meteorites or parts of them have to register them with SARA because they're part of our national heritage. They give us ideas about what, what has happened in, um, in the past and they belong to all of us, not just a select few. Okay, <clears throat> what else? Shipwrecks. All shipwrecks in the oceans around South Africa are heritage resources of historical significance because they provide historical information and instruments. So you need permission to bring them to the surface or to remove anything from that shipwreck. So maybe the picture isn't that exciting. You think, what on earth am I gonna learn from an oil tank? But they're not just those shipwrecks in South African waters. There are others. And if you think back way back to your history days, um, you may remember that um, 
there were many ships that came round the Cape, and and many of them were shipwrecked. In fact, that's what earned Cape the Cape area the name the Cape of Storms. So just a little marketing connection here. The first time that Cape Town was rebranded as a destination was way back in the 1600s when it became from the Cape of Storms to the Cape of Good Hope. Because you can imagine, how many people do you think would like to come to a place in a ship called the Cape of Storms? They probably weren't so excited about that. So uh, the Dutch East India Company rebranded um, the Cape as the Cape of Good Hope and hoped to start this station here. Okay, so there are many shipwrecks that are in our waters and those belong um, to SARA because they're part of our national heritage. They tell us stories about what happened in the past and um, they're, uh, they're like a little time capsule. And so in order to bring a, a ship up to the surface so that you ought to even go down and dive and get things off it. Though anything that you take from that then belongs and is part of our national heritage. What else? Burial grounds, graves, burial sites and monuments are physical and symbolic reminders of South Africa's history. And these are also protected by SARA. Like I said, when you go to a grave site, you will see a little plaque. Like I said, it's a metal poster um, that shows the SARA logo with South Africa in the middle of it to protect it. And again, a, grave site can, a graveyard can also be like a little time capsule. And it teaches us about that community and what was happening there. Um, when I have walked through a few graveyards in different places around South Africa, and sometimes you will see old graves and you'll see a few that, and the really sad ones where you see the little graves and then um, you can, you read the dates on the grave stones and <clears throat> you can see that there was probably an outbreak of some kind of disease or whatever, because there are a whole bunch of graves that are within a short space of time. And so graveyards are rich um, places of history. And not only that, but also they, are, um, they have a spiritual significance for many people. And so they have to be protected. They can't just be moved or tampered with. All right. And that brings our section on uh, culture and heritage to a close. <clears throat> The next uh, section that we're moving on to now, <coughs> excuse me, is quite different. Job and career opportunities within the tourism sectors. Right. So I'm going to write a word up over here. This is an, an important term for us to understand when we think about why it's important to have tourism in South Africa. That's the, the term labor intensive. So when we think about tourism, tourism is a labor intensive industry. That means that it takes many people to make the business happen. You, there may be some hotels that can afford to have robots and artificial intelligence. It, to make beds, but most of the time, in most places, it takes a person who can make a bed to change the sheets. It takes people to serve in restaurants, people who accept tickets, people who are tour guides. Yes, I can have a, I can listen to a tour on my phone by somebody else, but it's so nice when you have a person especially if you're an overseas visitor, an inbound tourist, you have a person who's able to take you around to different places and actually show you and help you to get around and not uh, go into areas that you shouldn't and they understand the culture. So tourism is labor intensive. It, it can employ a lot of people. So where are those opportunities for employment? Let's have, have a quick look at this infographic. I'm not sure if you can see it. 
but it says essentially one in 22 people in, are, who are employed in South Africa are employed in the tourism industry, if you look at the top right-hand side of the screen. And in fact, even more people are employed in the tourism business um, and the different sectors that it covers um, compared with mi the mining industry. That's a really interesting statistic. And so where are the tourism jobs? I'm looking at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Uh, many of them involved in road transport. So your minibus taxis, your coaches, those are your long distance buses, your city sightseeing buses, uh, those uh, shuttles from hotel to um, the airport and the hotel to various places. Many of the jobs in tourism are involved in road transportation. Then we also have food and beverages, so that's your restaurants, etc., hotels, accommodation, that's also a different aspect of hotels or bed and breakfast, guest houses, and then retail of products, so that's selling things, and then other. So there are many opportunities within the tourism industry for employment. And you need to know if you're going to be employed in the tourism industry, what kind of characteristics you have to have. So you need to be friendly. You're going to be probably meeting people a lot. There are some jobs within tourism that don't require you to meet people, but they're not as many as the ones that do. So being friendly is going to go a long way. You need to be assertive. That means to be able to present yourself, to say, this is who I am. This is what I need. Uh, this is what you need to do um, in a respectful, of course, and polite way. You need to be able to think on your feet, to be creative, honest. Well, that you need in any profession. You need to be well-groomed. So that means that when you wake up in the morning, that you make sure that you brush your hair and that whatever clothes you have or uniform, that it is clean, that your hands are clean. And that's very difficult to have dirty hands now within, with COVID. But... Um, you need to be well-groomed, look after yourself, be, look like the kind of person that you would like to go to if you were in a different place and you needed to trust them and ask them the way or ask them for their help. That's the kind of person you need to be. You need to speak well. That doesn't mean that you have to speak English necessarily, although that is helpful, but to be able to express yourself and to be able to express yourself to others and have them understand you. Organized, always a good characteristic to have, and the ability to work well under pressure. So imagine this, you are working in a restaurant, there are um, a whole bunch of people who've just arrived and you are a waiter on, and all of them have come to sit in your section, and there it's a table of 12 people, and you need to be able to serve them, carry on serving the other tables that you were serving. Um, this table might be, they might have specific requirements that, that are a little bit off the menu or whatever. And you need to be able to work well under the pressure because you have your boss who's managing the restaurant who expects you to perform in a certain way. You have the people in the kitchen who are making the food, the chefs, etc. And they're putting pressure on you. Why did you take this order in that way? Um, come and r they ring the bell. So you have to come and pick up the food quickly, quickly. And so you have to be able to work well under pressure. Uh, so all of those things are important characteristics within the tourism industry. And then, of course, working for long hours. You're never going to get away from that. Remember that tourists travel and part of them traveling involves 24 hours. If you work in the hotel or accommodation industry, people are arriving. Uh, hotels are open 24 hours a day. And so people are arriving. They need things all the time. So long hours, that's something you're going to have to get used to. All right. What do you need? Depending on which... Uh, part of the tourism industry you want to be involved in, you're going to need a degree, diploma, 
computer skills, qualifications, and work experience. Do not underestimate how important work experience is. Okay, so within the transport sector, um, we're look, we've already looked at personality types, but those are some of the skills that you're going to be, be needing. Um, customer service, ability to speak another language, that's always important, especially when you're dealing with international visitors, uh, people coming from different countries like China or Germany. If you think of our BRICS nation, so Brazil, Russia, India, and China, South African tourism has identified those um, countries as places that they want to get more tourists from. So if you could speak those languages, then you would um, definitely um, have a place in the tourism industry. Okay, then we also have ho the hospitality sector, um, and we've gone through um, all of the, those skills already. Having things like a first aid certificate though, also very helpful, and um, ha there it says there, health and safety training. Um, then tourism, tourism attractions, those are the places that people go to see, that's what they want to do and see. And often you will require a formal uh, re training for that, like an NSC in tourism, a National Senior Certificate, but um, and then a diploma or whatever, but then you will also have site training for that specific attraction. Um, if you want to become a tour, tourist guide as well, you can become you become a guide and you get registered for a specific area so that you know a lot about that area. Events and conferences. This is a major area, people, for um, possible tourism uh, job opportunities. And so the tourism conferences and events pull in major groups of people, especially in the business sector. And so getting involved in conferencing and event organizing, uh, that is definitely an opportunity for jobs within um, the tourism sector. And then tourism services, that's looking at your travel agents and your tour guides. And then entrepreneurship. Tourism is an amazing place for entrepreneurship. An entrepreneur being a person who starts their own business and who basically has a huge amount of courage to start something brand new, who sees a gap in the market and says, I'm gonna fill it. I have a product or a service that I think can fill it. So make sure that you are familiar with the personal characteristics of entrepreneurs. What will you need to be? You need to know about money or find people who are part of your, who are gonna be part of your business who will help you make wise money decisions. You've got to do the same with marketing. You have to be disciplined. You have to love challenges. Be organized, be willing to make decisions, solve problems, be adaptable or flexible. And again, dedicated, determined, and committed to working long hours. Most small businesses fail within the first two years. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, and there's lots of scope within the tourism industry to do that, make sure that you surround yourself with people who know and who are going to support you and have your best interests at heart, your own tribe, the right individuals bragging endlessly. Thank you so much for being part of our tourism revision for grade two, grade 11, term two. Goodbye.